Hello, everybody. Um, I want to tell you that um, the first of all, there are some library propaganda known as library newsletters out there in case you want to know a little bit about us and our project. My name is Sorel Oberlander. I'm the library dean at Cal Poly Humboldt, and I have the honor of working with A.J. Bielem, an extraordinary talent that we have been working together on a 3D herbarium, plus a number of students that have been on this project. So I want to share that it's quite the adventure. Now, I can't actually see my slides, so that's going to make it really fun. I'm going to share that the part that I'm going to talk about is the library is infrastructure for innovation. And this is an open pedagogy idea, or in, in fact, it's just a really good idea for folks to experiment with. I love idea gaps. And a good example of it is when I was talking about the digital dissection table, I know that sounds weird, but we have a digital dissection table in the library. It's the most popular thing that eighth and 10th graders see in the experience at the campus because they get to see say that they saw dead people at the library. Oh, it's crazy, but it's super fun. I did a presentation for about two hours showing this off at an Idea Fest uh, celebration at our library. And I kept on thinking, has anybody done this with plants? Because, you know, four humans, 150 animals, that's pretty interesting, but what about plants? And I found out when I searched, nobody has done anything like this that I could find. So what I did is I proposed this as an idea to the software engineering class that Dr. Shireen Bogle does every fall. She Every, every summer she asked me, Sorel, what ideas does, does the library have to kind of inspire or challenge software engineering students? And sure enough, I was very fortunate to provide a list of requirements and ideas and just some templates for us guiding what could a three-dimensional digital interactive herbarium look like. And I was super happy AJ and Team Flora came together and in 10 months developed a prototype based on the requirements. Now, this is a very fun assignment because the students have a real world challenge to work with. And they get to work with a sponsor who's, well, unusual, um, <laughs> has these ideas and he wants to explore them with the students. After this, I basically hire whoever's interested in working on, on the prototype to continue it to version one. That's a really effective way to create the curricular and co-curricular infrastructure to create innovation. And so I wanted to show the in yellow the areas that are curricular and in green the co-curricular. Because in hiring these students, or in the case of AJ, a, a brand new graduate, we're giving them real world job experience on a real project that they can demonstrate as a portfolio. But we're doing more than that. What we're also creating is something that can go back to the curriculum and now botany students can annotate this in their internships or their class assignments. We could also have the coolest exhibit next to the dead people. We can actually have the, the plants. We could also create a different kind of an engaging space and of course, release everything as an open source commercializable license. And that's important because we're really giving the students not only the opportunity of a lifetime, we're saying, if you want to commercialize this, you're the first one who has knowledge and experience to do that. If you don't, that's okay. Somebody else can. We don't want to stop innovation from changing our environment. So that's the infrastructure that we developed over the course of a few years. And we've developed software around seeding use analysis and a number of other ideas. But we're here to talk about the herbarium, and I'm going to call up my colleague, A.J. Bielem, the extraordinary programmer and project manager for the 3D herbarium. And here is your device of choice. Thank you, Cyril. So way back on uh, January 9th of this year, I went into my office for the first time after being hired as the uh, programmer and project manager for the 3D herbarium. I sat in my chair and looked at my computer, turned it on, you know, for the first time. And pretty much the first question that I asked myself was, uh, you know, how do I build this thing? 
what what is this thing what's it going to look like how's it you know how's it going to work how's it going to operate um so actually one of the first things that i did was i looked at other herbaria online um and as you can see this is a typical uh digital herbarium this is from cch2 california consortium of herbaria um and this this is generally what they look like it's uh it's basically just a big online database of herbarium images um and you know they're they're very dry. There's there's not much in the way of any sort of user interface, pretty much of any kind. It's just you know, here are the images from our database. Um, feel free to go ahead and, and peruse. So, I, I knew that I was pretty much on my own in terms of the user interface design and trying to make a three D herbarium a more immersive experience, a more fun way to learn about plants. Um, and then there's also this major issue of the the specimen discoloration over time. As you can see, you know those are uh, this is a search for Sequoia sempervirens, and so those are redwood needles there. And as you can imagine, they are green originally, and so a lot of those, as you can see, are not green. They they lose the color, which is a huge, in my opinion, a huge flaw of uh, a typical digital herbariums. So. Um, so that was so that was the first question, like how you know how how we're going to make this look, how we're going to make it fun, what's it going to look like. And then the the second thing for me personally, since I have basically no experience with plants, I am a pure nerd tech guy, I sit there and code all day. I have no like plants in my house or anything like that. Um, so the first thing for me was like you know species genus like. But you know, the cl the classification, you know, I never referred to myself as a homo sapien, you know, so I had to really get used to using, uh, you know, taxonomic terminology um, and really understanding the difference between the species and the genus, how species belong to different genera, et cetera, et cetera, how many general, generally how many species might belong to a genera, to any given um, genus. Um, and then there's, of course, the common names, right? That's the only way I would ever generally uh, refer to plants is by their common name, like probably most people. Um, so I had to figure out, you know, how how is this classification going to work? How when people enter into the search bar, when they enter an input, how am I going to figure out if it's a species that they're looking for, a genus, if it's a common name? Um, and, you know, how am I going to be able to handle all that? So, you know, naturally that, that requires data, right? I needed access to a lot of data um, in a very short amount of time because this beta version of the project was delivered in six months and so that was my time so i needed this data pretty quickly and so um you know the first question was well do i build a database that was a huge first question uh in the design and implementation of this project um and as i'll mention later i actually ended up getting away with building this beta version of this project without building a database uh and you know of course i'll talk about that and so the next question was well can i dynamically procure this data and if so from where um i had no knowledge of any sort of you know state or government programs or public programs that you know just readily offer up this kind of data so i had to do my research and sort of figure that out where i could quickly you know procure all this data and um and so the, it turns out that the answer was a little bit of both from the databasing and uh and dynamically procuring it perspective. Um, and that brings us to the APIs. So we use a multitude of APIs for this project. Um, four are our main APIs. The first one, which is a really fun one, which the real recommended specifically in the, um, in the project proposal is uh, our plant ID API, which allows the user to upload photos. And um, we can identify the plant. Like if, you up, if you're out for a nature walk, and you, ask, and you see a plant and you're unfamiliar with the plant species, you can take a picture of it and upload it to the site and the site will identify it for you through our plant ID API. It uses a machine learning service to identify your plants. That's really cool. And so the first API we actually got integrated and then we found out like right after we got it integrated that if you have an iPhone, you can just swipe up. If you have, take a picture of the plant, it'll also ID it for you. So hard to go with Apple, you know. Um, the next probably single most important and distinguished API for us is the Sketchfab API. It um, handles our model. Uh, well, Sketchfab itself handles our, our hosting of our 3D models. So we upload them to Sketchfab. Um, and then they also have the viewer API, which allows us to control, you know, the actual physical 3D model rendering on our site. And it allows us to annotate our 3D models. So it's not just somewhere where you log in and, you know, play with the 3D models of the plants. It's also a learning experience annotated with various information about each species. 
sketch fab api allows us to do that and um it's actually we do a demo yeah we do a demo to get so you don't have to wonder what i mean okay so here's um what plant? so that is the galtheria chalon aka the salal plant whoa all right different uh you know, sensitivity here but this is the plant and what do you want me to show the annotation of uh yeah uh so yeah so that's a typical so that's a typical photo annotation uh so most of the annotations are a photo of the subject the annotation and they're annotated by our botany assistant um and then so most of them are photo text annotations but if you click number six we also even have uh, video annotations to make it just that much more immersive, that much more fun. Um, you know, just get the user uh, interested, you know, and, and enthused while using the site. Um, so if we can go back to the slide. Okay, back to the slide, Joe, please. Perfect. So I get an idea of what, how we use the Sketchfab API. Um, so then the next couple of APIs, they're really more of uh, the back end sort of APIs that really provide the backbone for the website and make the website run. Um, so GBIF is our probably main backbone for this website. It's uh, That's an acronym for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. It um, it provides our taxonomic ranking. So as what I was speaking to before, when I was saying, uh, you know, how can we determine if this is a species, a common name, a genus? We actually use GBIF for that. Someone enters in search and put into our site. We take that information and we send it over to GBIF and say, you know, what on earth did this person just enter? You know, we'll determine if you even entered in anything relative to any plan or anything like that. And of course, if you didn't, we'll return an error. Um, so it provides all that it provides um, our barium media because uh, we're actually through GBIF, we're actually able to tap into our local herbarium on our campus and bring in local herbarium photos in addition to um, our 3D models that we have of each species. It gives us a, a common name base um, because we actually do now at this point for the version one, we're building our own database where we actually do database all the uh, the local specimens that our local herbarium has image cataloged. And so we keep a common name base for that, but we got that common name base from GBIF. And it also provides map distribution data for where the specimen can be found throughout the world. The other main backend um, API that we use is the iNaturalist API. It provides our main autofill, which was super, super crucial for the site, we felt. Um, GBIF also provides an autofill API, but frankly, it's just not quite as good. <laughs> and uh, so we use iNav for that. And um, we use iNav for a multitude of things. It actually has more of a, if, if anyone here is not familiar with it, it's almost so many site plants to buy a social component. Provides and also um, our botany program actually uses iNaturalist to submit a lot of assignments and um, you know do a lot of different things for their classes. So we're definitely planning on getting more uh, integration for that particular API into our software. So after I built again, I was dealing with a six month time frame here. So like after I built the most you know, wireframe of a website that I could as fast as possible while integrating all those different APIs and figuring all those different APIs out. And we shifted to uh, phase two of our little Gantt chart, which phase two was, um, you know, how do I 3D model stuff? They came into this with zero 3D modeling experience and we make all the 3D models in house. So, you know, I worked in the library, so that was a good start already, right? Library full of resources, endless resources everywhere to try to do and figure out everything, right? So naturally, the first thing that I did was uh, ask chat GPT. So a uh, uh, few techniques there. The main technique that they recommended was photogrammetry. And photogrammetry, um, it's a wonderful process where you, you take a myriad of very, very, very specific photos. You feed them into, in, into a photogrammetry software in a very specific fashion, and then it will return a 3D model for, for you from the photos that you took. And one thing that they recommend when you get started with actually with photogrammetry is shoes. It's one of the easiest things to, uh, to 3D model very well to have a clean model come out. 
And so naturally that was what I did. So after I got a couple of 3D models of my shoes, I was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is easy. This isn't is too bad at all. Uh, you know, I, th I thought there was going to be a lot more to it. And um, so then we moved on to the trees. We got our first couple of tree 3D models done. And um, there's a few ways to do trees as well. You have aerial photogrammetry. You have uh, pure uh, 3D generation, which, of course, aerial photogrammetry is just photogrammetry from like a drone, something with a high definition camera on it that you can take while actually in the air. Um, you can generate them purely in 3D modeling software, such as Blender, which we use frequently. Uh, and then there's a mix of both, which is what we actually do. That's how this tree was made. That's an instant cedar tree um, source from our campus. So what we do is we actually build the skeletons for these trees in a 3D modeling software in Blender. And then um, we go and actually we image the bark and the leaves locally on our campus. So that instant cedar tree is really close to my office. We take an image of it and we take that image and run it through a software that makes something called a PBR texture, which basically superimposes a three-dimensional image from a two-dimensional image. And uh, we take that PBR texture, we wrap it around the tree. So that's like real, essentially real bark from a real tree that we have, but the skeletons um, generated in Blender, as I said. And so that's, we feel like that's the best way to accurately capture trees uh, at the moment to really get the, the finest detail um, because aerial photogrammetry, unfortunately, just isn't gonna give you the kind of detail that we'd like to have, generally speaking, for our trees. But um, what we really wanted to focus on was what the HSC um, focuses on, which is flowering plants, generally speaking, of the area. Um, and in focusing on flowering plants, that's when you realize that 3D modeling is really, really hard. Um, so that's why we have that image of NASCAR. I just really like to refer to it as the NASCAR of 3D modeling because um, as NASCAR is, you know, the forefront of, of um, uh, engineering and uh, you know the the cutting edge of the technology of automotive technology plants would be that you know akin to that in 3d modeling because uh you know we've we've had multiple we've consulted a few people now different sorts of technology different kinds of softwares to, to what could be best to 3d model plants and it's just uh, it's it's a tough one so that, that uh, lower right hand corner there that's um that's a poppy that we tried to 3d model and it just gives you an idea of the main issue with 3d modeling plants is that they have these basically two-dimensional elements on them called leaves right that uh you know just they're not they're not three-dimensional it's you know it's like trying to 3d model a piece of paper it's you know they're you're missing that last crucial dimension and that's why you see you know so many holes in the leaves there they don't fully form and i mean that jar is not even the, the center of focus in these particular photos but you can still perfectly see the helix wrapped around it uh you know for the screw cap you, know, you can make out all kinds of fine details but unfortunately those very small dimensions provide just a really hard time for the the 3d modeling softwares and so um the future that we're looking at for these plants particularly is um what's called a micro ct scanner that seems to be going forward probably the best way, but um, they're not exactly the cheapest instruments out there, unfortunately. So, so we'll be looking at uh, the logistics of that very soon. Here's an image of uh, of our Sketchfab page, and it really just sort of gives a, a general idea of, of of what it's like really trying to do this. Because as you can see, you can see. Um, more photos that are similar to that poppy from the last page where there are just holes in the leaves. Some of the models, they just don't come out cleanly. And then other ones come out absolutely beautifully. You can see, uh, you know, a few of the ones like the Salicornia, which is happens to be Cyril's favorite. Um, that one came out really, really well. And so it's really, it's it's almost just a roll of the dice. You know, sometimes they, they come out cleanly and sometimes they don't. Um, our public models, in which I'm about to make a bunch more of our, our models public here pretty soon, um they can be seen right there down there at the link on our sketchpad page i think we only have five public ones right now but i um will be making many more of them public um as version one gets closer to release so how do i 3d model stuff with these cameras so you really start to get into the weeds with photogrammetry and 3d modeling when it comes to plants so the first thing you have to do is get very very comfortable and familiar with cameras uh dslrs mirrorless cameras um in general so me i hadn't you know it's it started this 2023 i had used a i haven't used anything other than a camera phone in a good six years unless you're like a photographer right there's really no reason 
So I had to re-familiarize myself to really get familiar with and comfortable with cameras. That's our student assistant, David, there doing a shoot. Um, and so the by far the most single most important thing that we deal with is depth of field. When you're shooting for photogrammetry for this 3D modeling, when you take the photographs, I cannot stress clearly enough, every single part of the subject needs to be in focus, at least for a few photos. So dealing with this equation is super important for us. I will not get into actual mathematics of the equation. I don't want to watch eyes glaze over. Um, but N is your, your f-stop, C is your circle of confusion, U is your distance from your subject, and uh, F, is the, F is your focal length. And so generally, we can reduce it down to that second equation, keep it pretty simple. The other main things that we deal with is the ISO, which is your light sensitivity setting, your shutter speed, which is, of course, exactly what it sounds like. And... Uh, Oh, and the software. So we actually use a remote shooting software. Um, you know, there's a computer set up right next to that camera. And so we use a remote shooting software to actually do our shoots with a, um, a turntable that you also need an app for. So there's actually a lot of software that you have to learn to use just to properly use the setup. And so once you get all that done, then you move on to your software. So as we were building this, again, this is a six month process. Um, the first software that we tried is called Meshroom. Of course, we're library folks. We love open source software, right? Yeah, and it's open source. So that was super cool. Um, high quality. It's a really, really good program. The only problem is it's only on Windows and Linux, which for our group at the time really didn't work. Um, and it also has very specific GPU requirements with these CUDA GPUs, which was the reason we couldn't even get it to run on our server, which I'll speak to a little bit more in a second. So a really great software if you have the right hardware to run it. Highly recommend it. Um, next came PhotoCatch. Now, PhotoCatch is absolutely awesome for simpler projects. Um, that plant was actually shot with PhotoCatch, um, which, you know, no experience is required. Anyone in this room, if you wanted to, if you have uh, any sort of Apple product, uh, you know, Mac computer, iPhone, you could download um, PhotoCatch and you could have a solid 3d model made like before you left this room i mean if you would just wanted to make a small 3d model of something like on the table or whatever it's quite literally that easy and you can even do it with video you don't even need photos you can take a video of an object and it'll spit out a 3d model within like a few minutes so this is an absolutely awesome software and it was a great introductory into photogrammetry it really gave me um, a solid like uh grounding and understanding of basic 3d modeling techniques and photogrammetry techniques and then it was, a, it was a really good facilitator for me to then move on to uh, Metashape, which is the current software that we use. It is resource intensive, not open source, unfortunately, but um, it is it's very, very good software and it is multi-platform. It runs on Windows, Mac, Linux, um, which is very important for us because we actually just got this program. We actually just, you know, just for the start of the this project, we just had a program Metashape running on a couple of laptops. And our average time to create a model would, it got up as high as anywhere to uh, like six to nine hours. So we knew that we had to find a solution for that. So we actually have uh, Metashape now running on a Linux server with uh, with eight GPUs, which cut our model uh, compile time down to roughly about an hour, hour and a half. So huge difference. And um, like I said, it's a really great software. Just too bad it's not open source. Uh, quick look under the hood. So for this beta, so it was a sort of an interesting project because we were looking to hire students to also work on it. So I built a beta with just pure code, no frameworks. It, for a long, for the longest time, for about five months of the six months of the project, it was just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's a purely a front-end project, purely, um, purely that ran in your browser. And it wasn't until the absolute last minute that I had to add a little bit of PHP because there was some data from CSV files that we needed to bring in simply for reference, basically just metadata. Um, and just again, because of the time frame, and because for half the time we hired computer science assistants uh, halfway through the project, so for half the project it was just me working on it. So there's really no time to build like a detailed database. So we kept everything in CSV files to begin with, and um, so that was how I sort of got away with building the whole front end beta interface with with no database, slide this little bit of PHP just to bring in some data from some CSV files. But now for the version one, we're converting it into a. We want this to be a very scalable program. We want this to be adaptable to pretty much any discipline um, and make it a general 3D exhibit learning tool. So for that, um, so we're using frameworks this time. So our front end framework is Next.js, which probably most of you have heard of or at least heard of React, definitely. So it's a React framework focused on speed and SSR. 
because we do so much fetching, we bring in so much data from these APIs, um, we, we want to focus on server side rendering um, and try to, you know, decrease the, the, the any wait time as much as possible, as much as we possibly could. And on the back end, and this is actually a full stack framework as well, Next.js. And so on the back end, we're using Laravel, which is also a full stack framework, PHP framework, focused on auth, queues, a lot of stuff, streamlining databases and stuff like that, and minimalist code. And so if you're wondering why we're using two full stack frameworks, well, it's because we, me and my sister, we prefer like JavaScript in general. And so we like uh, Next and React and everything else like that. But the school, for whatever the reason, they absolutely love our this web hosting the shared web hosting company that uh, they only run LAMP stack servers. And so we pretty much have to use PHP on the back end. So that's fun. Um, well, and I, yeah, honestly, I just kind of wanted to learn Laravel anyway. So I figured mine as well. And so how we connect up the two is with this middleware called inertia. And so that's what allows us to use all the next and NPM node stuff on our, on a PHP backend. Um, so this is a quick look under the hood. Um, so V1 and beyond. So what's coming now is a full static website. Right now it's just it's pure beta, pretty much just sort of like a proof of concept. It's really built for like very large screens. We actually have a really large 60 inch touch screen in our office that this is really meant to be displayed on. So uh, we're coming with a full static website. There is a screenshot of uh, our current code and how it looks on a phone screen in one of our 3D models. Um, and it'll be a general 3D learning platform. It'll be a multidiscipline open source. As this is an image of a, a mushroom that uh, our mycology club here on campus uh, 3D modeled actually with PhotoCatch, as I mentioned. They went and got, they were able to get a 3D model done um, within a few days. They went on that walk like a couple of days later, and um, then they were able to make that level of quality of a 3D model their first time using the software. Um, and so we're planning on having them, uh, you know, give us a few more, and that'll give us a start on a. Um, I don't know what you would call it, a mycarium, maybe. For a 3D exhibit for mushrooms would be called, as opposed to the herbarium. Um, and then, and then uh, um, we're looking at um, turning it into a dynamic website, allowing student login and student off, uh, allowing them to contribute, uh, whether it be 3D models, annotations to the 3D models, or just uh, allowing them another way to submit their uh, relative related uh, botany assignments on iNaturalist. And so all that's coming. And um, we're definitely planning on uh, having layered opacity views for the, uh, specifically for the trees, maybe for the plants and in the coming months, similar to the, the dissection table that's the real mentioned, which allow, it allows layers of opacity. So, uh, you know, we don't have a demo of this, but you can slide that opaque, that slider there and it will actually go all the way out to the skin, you know, full skin body, and it goes all the way down, you know, revealing the layers of arteries, muscle, tendons, various parts of the human anatomy. And we're planning on doing something similar with that for the trees so that you would just be able to peel back that opacity layer, see all the various layers underneath the trees instead of just being able to see the exterior of the specimen. So lots of really, really exciting things to come for V1. This has been such an exciting project. And um Thank you again, Cyril, you know, for, for having me on. And uh, yeah, it's really, really been a blast. And uh, I'll hand it back to Cyril. Oh, well, it's really, thank you all. We appreciate any feedback and suggestions. And to be honest, um, we are very interested in hearing what your thoughts are of creating 3D exhibit tools, um, because I think this is an immersive experience that we really want our students and our prospective students to see. About two to 3,000 eighth and 10th graders visit our library every year. And they walk away from the campus after visiting three or four different locations, thinking the library is the coolest place. And one of the coolest tools that they engage in in the library is the dissection table. And so we have plans to this, a GIS archive that has a similarity in interactivity but it's fun to create and it's fun to co-create with students because in many ways, that is the future of learning. I think earlier a, a speaker said that we have to change our assignments in order to really not have chat GPT answer the question. Well, projects do that. And I wanna thank you all for your time and thank you AJ for an incredible project. Right. Demo again.
while we're answering any questions or Okay, I'm so fangirling out here on this one because I uh, I was in little herbarium the start of it at Acadia University 20 over 20 years ago. So this is like next gen, next level. So it's very exciting. I don't think we'll ever probably be able to do it at my place, but maybe questions. Great, no questions, awesome. <laughs> so this will be released February and it's gonna be uh, open source and it allows for commercialization and it allows you to not make it an herbarium. You could basically make it whatever you want as a 3D exhibit. It could be art, rocks, you name it. So thank you. And there is a question, great. Hi, uh, really great presentation. I'm just curious, uh, one thing I, I didn't pick up was, uh, what kind of model do you use to gen how do you generate your blender model in the first place like you said you build a skeleton where does the where do the parameters come from to develop that skeleton fantastic question um so within blender there are um I forget the exact name of them but they're basically sort of like plugins and um so we use a plugin called uh oh, and i really cannot remember what those little programs they're not called plugins but they're they're called something but we use one called sapling so we download sapling and so sapling gives you sort of a starter template and it comes with a menu that has these various parameters and it takes maybe a few days a couple of days to really sort of play with the parameters and really get used to it because you can spit out i mean probably you know billions of different combinations of little trees just by varying these probably hundred little parameters so once you really you go through their docs you get familiar with their parameters um it's pretty much once you really get used to that menu you can just do a lot of presets and then you once you again just after trial and error pretty much you can kind of come out with the tree that you look for Oh, you should stay up here. They're going to be asking questions of you. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one more. I'm blind. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It's really interesting. Um, as I'm looking at these 3D models, I'm thinking, do you have any plans for like a virtual reality aspect to it or a augmented reality? What an excellent question. Right. I'm going to receive the check later. So <laughs> With Sketchfab, there's an AR component and a VR component built in right down here as two ways to view this. So you can actually see it in VR, see it in AR, and it's easy. It's already built into the application and then put into the UI thanks to AJ. Right. It's app-free AR, app-free VR. Um, when you pull it out on a mobile device, when you go to our Sketchfab account, it's not on the site as of yet, but when you go to our Sketchfab account, again, just with a phone and you click that button, it immediately puts it in AR in your, in your position. I love easy. Even though I gave him the hardest thing to do 3D modeling now. <laughs> Did not know what I was getting myself into. Uh, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.